Hey, good morning to you, church. Oh, wait. I, you, know, you know me. I like a little feedback. This is a little conversation. Good morning, church. All right. All right. Are you guys excited to be in the house of the Lord today? Yes. Yes. Well, I've got a real cheerful topic for you today. We are going to talk about suffering. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm glad you're excited about it um, because I do actually think there is uh, some great growth for us that can happen through our suffering. I know that for, for many of us, we've, we've gone through all different kinds of suffering. There can be emotional or mental suffering. There can be physical suffering that you go through. You pay, pain in your knees after double knee replacement surgery. You can have a pain in your back. You can have a pain in your neck, which is basically trying to walk your kids through online learning. That would be what that is. Uh, there's all different kinds of lengths of suffering. Uh, around here, what we call somebody who goes through a really long period of suffering, we call you a Buffalo Bills fan. And, uh, but there's hope on the horizon. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> you know, for me, I am, uh, I love the Bills, but I'm also a Philadelphia Eagles fan. They're my first team. And uh, you, you know what the prophet Isaiah wrote long, long before even Jesus was born is we will rise on wings like eagle. We will run and we will not grow weary. And if that's not a word from the, okay, no, like I, I, I'm not sure that the best way to start a message is to take a Bible verse out of context for your favorite football team. But here we are today. No, I, I joke uh, to get us started, but honestly, suffering is something that so many of us have had to go through or will go through in our lifetime, and it doesn't result in laughter. It's, it's really serious. In fact, many of us in this room have even walked through that together through different seasons in life. I think of, of walking through situations with uh, people even in this room today or, or watching online today who uh, you, you have had to say goodbye to a child and the, the devastating loss there or, or conversations after the, the cancer treatment just didn't work. And then you're left with a lot of grief and a lot of questions for why. Or as a parent, maybe even your child wandered away from their redemptive potential. And what happens when we're going through our suffering seasons is oftentimes we can't think right, we can't sleep, we can't eat. It consumes all of us. Suffering can really just devastate our lives. And so it leads us to our question for today is how do we handle suffering well? How do we as Christians do that? How do we as humanity do that? How, how do we process this? Because uh, many of us have had to deal with this or are dealing with this or will deal with this in our lives. And I think one thing that we could think about with suffering is there's like all these different variations. It's like, well, I don't suffer as much as this person. And so, and I, and I think that that's true. There's definitely, you know, variations within all of that. But I think that sometimes for us, we can look at and say like, oh, well, that person suffers so much more than me. And then we don't even look at internally our own suffering that we're going through. We can end up suppressing kind of what God might even be trying to help us deal with in our own hearts and lives. So I don't think that that's the best vantage point for us today is to compare to somebody else, but to look at our own hearts and our own lives. And so we are going to open up scripture together today. We're going to be looking at the book of First Peter for the next eight weeks, and I'm excited for us as a church to do a deep dive together and for the resource that our church has put together for you, I think is going to be helpful in your daily walk with the Lord. But let's open up together his word. This is First Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. Peter writes this, In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Christ Jesus is revealed. Though you, may have, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, the first thing we see right here in this text is that you and I, we will suffer. 
And I know that that's not a very hope-filled message, but I do think that it's the reality of our lives, that we will go through that in our lives. We, uh, we, you know, and, and I think the question is really like, well, so how did we get here? And, and many of you know this, but the, the, this whole earth is filled with, uh, it's a sin-infested planet. Like when we said no to God a long time ago as humanity, sin came and invaded this space. It wasn't how God originally intended it, but sin came. And now as a result, like we have suffering because of sin that is in this world and even the sin from others or sin inside our own hearts and lives that can cause suffering for ourselves or for others. There's a whole variety of ways for how that pain can come as a result in our lives. And honestly, a lot of different people and a lot of different perspectives have tried to make sense of suffering. And I want to talk for a minute just about some of the common, most accepted worldviews in our world today. Uh, so you've got like the Buddhist or Eastern religions, and they look at suffering as more like an illusion. Suffering is, is all about, you, you end it by uh, getting, to, getting more and more enlightened. That is the goal. And the root of suffering is actually our desires. So there's three primary desires in Buddhism that you want to try to rid yourself of, which is greed, ignorance, and hatred. And while these things definitely can cause suffering in our own lives or in the lives of others, um, from, from my perspective, I really look at it as there are a lot of other things that can also lead us to suffering. I mean, there's only two things in this world we know are for sure, and that's death and New York State taxes, am I right? <laughs> but honestly, the, the Buddha asserts that he was able to get to the spot where he was able to no longer experience any suffering. And so our goal would be to try to attain to that level so we could rid the world of suffering in our own lives and in the lives of others, specifically focusing in on greed, ignorance, and hatred. And the problem is, at least for me, is it's like even just the harder and harder I try, it's like I can never get to that point of perfection. And actually what that ends up doing is it actually creates like a crushing pressure on my shoulders where I'm like, I can't live up to it. There's also a second view that we'll look at today, common, more common in, in our culture, which would be like Western or secular culture. And Western so secular culture really tries to make sense of suffering in saying that suffering is really a curse that we are under, that we need to endure. There's a, a pastor, uh, an author, his name is Timothy Keller. He writes about this in his fantastic book, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering. He basically says that secularism and a Western worldview is actually the least equipped to be able to handle suffering in our world because it, it provides no meaning to suffering or pain. They're, they're really, it, it just is. And so again, the solution for us is we need to try harder and we need to push for change with those people, that group over there who is oppressing that group over there. And again, some of these things can be good things, but it might not be the whole picture. If suffering is just a curse, for us, it leaves us with no hope for what is to come. Suffering is just always going to be there, and you and I, we need to just get used to it. There's a third worldview we'll look at today called the Darwinian or materialistic worldview. And it, it's similar in some ways to the one we just looked at. But again, there's no meaning beyond uh, survival of the fittest. Life just is. Like for some people, they've been born in a really great place and some people they've been born in a really bad place. So they have to suffer. It's really all just a cosmic coincidence that uh, we are where we are. And the problem with the Darwinian or materialistic worldview is that really at the end of that path, life again has no meaning or purpose to it. And so it leaves you wondering why exist at all and, it can, and here's the thing, our brains were literally wired by God to try to make sense of the chaos of this life. Like we're, we're hardwired to try to figure this out. And so that's where I see some flaws in the materialistic worldview. And unlike in these worldviews, Christianity says 
Suffering is not something that has no redeemable purpose for our lives. Christianity admits suffering is real, and it's, but it has a far more hope-filled message than the Western or secularism worldview. You see, Jesus talked about this pain when, when he came back to redeem all of humanity. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Like you and I are going to have pain and, sh- and struggles. You and I know this, we've experienced this. And the author who writes this book that we're gonna be diving into uh, this whole, these whole next two months, Peter went through so much suffering in his own life. So he's writing this letter in around 62 AD, um, and and Jesus uh, left in the 30s. So this is about 30 years um, after Jesus has ascended back up to heaven. And Peter had seen so much suffering from his closest friends. Obviously, he saw Jesus brutally beaten uh, for what Jesus taught. Then another one of his friends, James, had been murdered for his faith, declaring about Jesus. And it's within five years of writing this letter himself uh, that Peter's life would be taken for proclaiming the gospel. So if anybody has a right to talk about what real suffering is, it is this man right here. And I think what's, what's really interesting is that he says, you have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Well, why is that? I think, like we said, suffering is a result of living in a broken planet and our own brokenness inside of us. But the other truth about suffering is that suffering can actually deeply test our faith. It can really show us what is real. Suffering reveals our deepest held beliefs that we hold to be most true inside of us. Not what we say we believe, like on the surface, or maybe what we post on social media, but like what we actually internally believe. When you're going through the fire, that's where it really gets shown. The passage says, you may have had to suffer grief and all kinds of troubles, trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise. You see, when suffering comes, it's not this time where it creates faith. It's actually where our faith is most revealed. It doesn't create faith. It reveals faith when we go through suffering. And there's this message in our culture that is just like, hey, the ultimate pursuit is happiness. The goal for each of us as humanity is that we just need to find what makes us happy. And so part of that goal would be eliminating suffering in our lives. And, and I even think about this as like, it gets sprinkled in with Christianity sometimes. It's like, that's the pursuit. And then you kind of like sprinkle a little Jesus on, on top of that too. So like Jesus, what he wants for you is he wants to bless you, which again is true. But then it gets, it gets twisted. This is what happens. This is how the enemy does it. It's like a truth that ends up getting just slightly twisted. And then it can lead you down a wrong path. And then when you're going through the suffering, you're like, wait, this doesn't make sense. And really it's a reality of a, a truth got twisted for us. And so if, if the message is that God blesses you and then you start going through suffering or you're like, hey, God wants to bless your finances. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait, I'm still struggling to pay my bills. Like this message isn't lining up with reality. And again, something's, something's got twisted within this message. And the truth of it is, it says it right here, is that God is after something much more important than your money, than your cash. He is after ultimately your heart. He is after your life. We just sang it together. You deserve the glory, God. Like that is what we are after as a church, is bringing glory and honor and praise to Jesus Christ. If you believe that, say amen. Amen. And you know, I think sometimes we can get wrapped up in trying to pursue temporary happiness as opposed to trying to pursue what it is that God is actually after. The goal, this passage says, is that you go through the suffering, you go through the trials, that it might result in praise and glory and honor of Christ Jesus. That is what God is ultimately after. But it's hard for us down here. It's hard for me, uh, you know, honestly. And I think about this question sometimes. I think about like what Job went through in that story. But I even think about for myself, and I'll have you think about this just for a brief moment. What would be the thing 
that would be the hardest for you to process going through pain and suffering in your own life here on earth? Like, what would be that thing that would be like, man, I don't even know if I could recover from that. I want you to think about that for a moment. I think for me, it's, it's the idea of the loss of my spouse or the loss of one of my children. Like that for me can, if I, if I sit on that for more than 60 seconds, I can literally get physically ill. Like my body starts to react to that. And that's just the thought of it, let alone trying to actually navigate that pain and that level of suffering. But I want you to think about right now in your own life, If you were to go through whatever that thing was that would be the most devastating suffering that you could go through, how would you want to respond? And how would you want to respond to God within that? I think this is a time for us to be preparing and thinking about what, how would I do that? And I know for me, sometimes I think about, I I don't know how I would handle uh, my most devastating loss in my life. I, I, I try to think about that. I try to think about like, I want, I would want to stay true and committed to God, but, but would I really? It's an honest question that I I don't have the answer to. And I hope I never have to uh, go through, but I think about this sometimes is would I actually give up on God? Would you give up on God if you went through the most devastating suffering in your life? Now, uh, we didn't read these verses today, but you'll be reading them this week on your own. The first five past uh, verses in 1 Peter 1 really is talking about, in this letter, about how we should have really good and true doctrine In other words, like correct views about who God is. And it's actually when we have that true doctrine that it will allow us to stay grounded and rooted when that suffering comes. And so I'm excited for you to be growing in that because I I want all of us as a church to not get swayed no matter what storm may actually come our way. I want to be a church who stands on the truth of who God is no matter what storm we face. If you believe it, say amen. And the truth about suffering is that as we go through it, it actually creates a crossroads moment for us. It's kind of like a pivotal place where we can decide which way we're going to turn. Are we going to turn towards God or are we going to turn away from God? Uh, I asked my friend for permission to share this story, and he said yes. And uh, I I was doing a a funeral just recently, and somebody about my age, and uh, he's got a young child, and um, it was the funeral service for his mom. And so you can imagine the the grief he was going through. Um, In that week, uh, we talked a lot just to prepare, and I, I wanted to try to help him walk through some of that grief that he was navigating. And one of the things he shared with me was, you know, hey, going through this suffering that I'm going through right now or the pain that he's going through right now, he said, it's really starting to make me ask some real deep questions. The truth for him is he used to come to church really faithfully, and it's been 10 years since he's actually been in a church at all or been in community or, or had regular relationship, um, even uh, trying to help grow and foster his faith. But what he said is, you know what? This is really making me rethink some things. And even my my own son is asking me some deep questions about God that I'm not so sure I have the answers to. And I was so grateful that in the midst of his deepest pain, he was taking a step towards God. He wasn't taking a step away from him. He didn't even blame God for the circumstances that surrounded his mother's passing. He simply wanted to get closer to God. I think that suffering for us creates a pivotal crossroads moment. And the truth of suffering is that suffering can mature our faith, but it doesn't automatically do it for us. It doesn't just happen. It doesn't always happen for us. Your suffering can draw you closer to God. It can push you further away. I like the way that uh, the uh, English Standard Version writes uh, this passage that we've been looking at today. It says it this way, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith may be found to result in praise. 
You see, when you're testing of your faith, when you go through that testing of your faith, it may result in growth of your faith. It may. It may lead you toward our suffering servant, Jesus Christ, but it may not. We're at that crossroads moment. And I think sometimes even for us as we're going through that crossroads moment, it can be so overwhelming. Like the grief is, is so thick that it can be hard to even think about, hard to process. And what I want you to know that it's, it's okay to have big feelings. Got me in my feelings. Like that's, that's okay for you to, to, to feel that, to go through that. In fact, even for David, he uh, writes in, in his book, in, in the Psalms, he writes, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Like, where are you guys? He's not, he's not saying that emotionless. Here's a man after God's own heart who is crying out to him. He he's, writes angry psalms. He writes sad psalms. It's okay to talk to God about the reality of your feelings. The goal is not for us to try to suppress our feelings and be like, ah, it's not really that bad. Like, God's in control. I'm good. We can be honest. I think the gospel actually gives us more latitude to actually have bigger feelings where it's like, Man, the pain of this world is really, really real. But it also gives us a hope that is really, really real as well. And I think that one of the things I think about when I think about suffering is I think about what is God doing when we are in suffering? I think that's a common question we can ask even when we're in our big feelings is where is God in the midst of all of this? And I think we have to look to the truth of Scripture to get that answer. It says this in one of my favorite verses of all time in Psalm 34, 18. It says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted. If you want to know where God's at, look for somebody who's hurting. You know, we, we say oftentimes, like, God is on the move. And we think of it as like, yeah, like saving souls. And yes, yes. But you know where God is also on the move? To the person who's crying every single night with tears soaking their pillow. Like that's who God is drawing near. That's the character of who God is. Because again, what God is after is after intimacy with you and with me. And I think what's so important for us to recognize is who Jesus is and what he did for us. He emulated his life through suffering of all different kinds. He came back for you and for me. And so suffering and becoming more like Jesus is all tied together for us. There's this, uh, there's this English minister who wrote this uh, poem during World War I. And I actually think it's really potent and powerful for us. His name is Edward Shalito. This is in the year 1919. But here's what it says from Jesus of the Scars. This is the end of the poem. The other gods were strong, but thou wast weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to a throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. Do you have wounds? Do you have hurts? Are you exhausted after this last year? There's a God who can see your pain who can empathize with your pain. He is the one who gives our wounds meaning. He is the one that we can actually know through our own wounds. It's be through our own wounds that we can actually appreciate the wounds that he has gone through as well. But the truth of it is, we've all seen people in our lives who have gone through something devastating in their life. And I say this with no judgment or accusation on, on anybody, but we've seen people who have become very angry as a result of going through suffering. Or, you know, and so the question I think for us today is, what's the difference between bitter and better as you go through suffering? Like, like how do you get through suffering and not be in a spot where you become bitter? Because that's not the path we want to head down. And I think... The answer is found in Jesus. And I don't say it just to say it because it's the Sunday school answer. I think it really is the truth. As we see this in verses eight and nine, as the worship team comes back out, here's what it says. Pay attention to this. Even though you do not see him now, 
You believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. What's the end story of all of this suffering? Think about that for a moment. What's the end story of all of this? Jesus is saying here, or Peter is writing here, I should say, is that he is pointing towards the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, what we don't recognize oftentimes in our daily lives is that the, the end of the story has already been written. One day, Jesus is coming back and he is going to make all things new. It says this in Revelation 21, 4. It says, I want to make sure I get it right here. He will wipe every tear from your eyes. There will be no more death. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more crying. There will be no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. You see, the suffering that we experience here and now on earth is temporary. It's, it's short term. And here's the thing about the truth of who God is. God has suffered on your and I's behalf. When you and I are going through our own pain and suffering, he is with us. And one day he is coming back and there will be no more suffering. It will be eradicated forever. And oh, what a glorious day that will be. But in the here and in the now, he has called us as a church to remain faithful to him, to lean on him as we go through it together. So I'm gonna invite you to stand right now. I'm gonna invite you even to just take a moment to close your eyes and take a moment with the Lord. Because maybe for you right now, you're going through that pain and suffering and it's really challenging. Or maybe you're even, as we've talked about this today, you're getting nervous about the pain that could come your way. I want you to know that heaven is open to you. If you are in a spot where you're going through it right now, you are not alone. God sees you and he is moving closer to you, closer than a brother, closer than a sister. God is moving towards you with love, with arms that are wrapping around you, his child. You can't even imagine how much he loves you and how much he hurts for you. So much so that he would come back to earth just for you, just for you to suffer in your place, the death that you and I deserved. He would come back for you and for me. And if you're worried about the pain of tomorrow, know that Jesus is with you. Jesus can empathize with your pain. And one day, all of this pain and all of this suffering that you and I continue to go through will be gone. So Lord Jesus, I pray that you would give us the strength to be able to navigate the hurts and the pains. Would you allow us to not be a people when we go through the storms who waver, but who stay anchored on your truth, on who you are, that you are real, that you are love, and that you are with us. You have not forsaken us. You have not forgotten us. So Lord, this morning, we declare our faith in you. We can't do this on our own. So we ask by the power of your Holy Spirit, would you help us to navigate suffering well, faithfully, to stay committed to you and to your truth. If you believe that prayer, would you say amen? Amen. Let's sing about our beautiful Jesus together.